us uh, come back to the final couple of suttas uh, uh, of this section of the retreat. Uh, and uh, I have been, we have been looking at some of the blockages or hindrances to meditation practice and not just to meditation but to the path in general. And one of the big ones, uh, the biggest one, the one that is really worthwhile putting the most emphasis on is ill will. Uh, because it is painful, it is problematic, uh, and it uh, is, is very blocking, and it causes so much disharmony and so many problems. Uh, but it's not just ill will that is a problem, uh, sensuality is also a problem. Uh, and um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, sensuality, sensual pleasures. Uh, and uh, the Pali word for this is karma. Karma is the word. It's not the same as kamma. It's two different words. Karma is one word, kamma is another one. Uh, and kamma is spelled with double M, same as karma in Sanskrit. Uh, but karma is uh, just only has a single M but a long A in it. Uh, and this word karma, which is uh, usually translated as sensual pleasures, it has two separate meanings that are important to keep in mind. It means the kind of the personal experience of desire, yeah, desire for the objects of the five senses, whatever you desire in this realm, all of that is part of that. Uh, sensual desire. Uh, but it also actually includes the objects themselves. Uh, yeah? So karma also are all the things in that realm are also karma. And this is important to understand if you want to understand what is meant by sensual pleasures in Buddhism. Uh, we're going to be looking at a large number of similes that are usually read out on all of these retreats. Uh, and uh, these similes really only start to make sense if you understand these two sides of the wo word karma. K long A M A uh, sensual pleasures. So, so uh, uh, first of all, I'm going to read out this little sutta, which I don't think I have read out on a retreat before. This is called the Tapusa Sutta, and it's just a small extract from quite a long sutta in the Anguttara Nines, uh, and it's just uh, to show how sensuality can be a hindrance on the path. And this again is the Buddha talking. It's autobiographical. Sutta, he talks about his own experience, how he had to overcome hindrances and problems. Uh, and this is about the hindrance of karma, specifically. Uh. So this is what the Buddha has to say. Or, yeah, the Buddha talking back about the time before he was a Buddha. Before my awakening, uh, while I was still only searching for awakening, Bodhisattva, uh, reading that as Bodhisattva, which means like intent on awakening, uh, not yet fully awakened, it occurred to me too. Good is renunciation, good is solitude. Yet my mind did not launch out upon renunciation and become placid, settled and liberated in it, uh, though I saw it was peace, saw it as peaceful. Uh. So this, s these um, various uh, words, they're placid, settled, liberated, etc., usually refers to the jhana states or samadhi states. Uh, so even though he saw the problem, uh, he didn't actually go beyond and achieve samadhi as a consequence. It occurred to me, why is it that my mind does not launch out upon renunciation, become placid, settled and liberated in it, uh, though I see it as peaceful? Uh, and it occurred to me, I have not seen the danger in sensual pleasures. Uh, I have not cultivated that insight into danger. Uh, I have not achieved the benefit in renun renunciation and have not pursued it. Therefore, my mind does not launch out upon renunciation and become placid, settled and liberated in it, uh, though I see it as peaceful. Uh, so here the Buddha is saying that one of the reasons you cannot attain that deep samadhi, the deep stillness, that uh, you know, in the end we should all uh, at achieve or try to aim for, you know, in the end kind of look towards, uh, because it leads to deep insight eventually. Uh, that one of the big problems is uh, sensuality. It's one of the problems uh, that kind of stands in the way. Uh. And um, I don't know, I s I've spoken to some of you during the interviews, uh, and uh, it's, it's quite a common thing that people do the meditation practice and it's going quite well. Uh, and they come to a kind of plateau uh, where it stops, it doesn't go any further. Yeah, kind of, yeah, it's nice, it's kind of fairly peaceful, nothing is really happening. Uh, and uh, it kind of stops there. Uh, and why does it stop? And then you, you look into your mind and you're not really sure why it stops. Because, you know, you at that point there's no real kind of clear hindrances, you're not really upset about anything, there's no kind of clear desires. Uh, uh, it's fairly nice and peaceful, but how come it doesn't go further? Uh, 
And this is the kind of thing that blocks you. Huh? Yeah? It is, these are very subtle defilements. You don't actually see it is there. There's some attachment, for example, to the body. Huh? There's an attachment to the five senses. And that attachment to the body and the five senses is actually part of this thing we call uh, sensuality. Huh? Yeah? And because you are attached, the mind doesn't want to go any further, doesn't want to drop any further, because as you drop even further down, uh, you have to let go of the senses more. Uh, and that is kind of where the problem arises. Uh. So the uh, investigation into sensuality actually enables us, allows us uh, to let more go of the body and the five senses, so as to deepen the meditation. It's not the thing that people usually think of as sensuality, yeah? we think of more desires and that sort of thing. And that's what I mean when I say these are profound things, uh, they're very deep things uh, that have to do with very uh, subtle states of mind, and things that we often don't see. Uh. And this is one of the reasons also why when you look at the Satipatthana Sutta, the Dhamma Nupassana, contemplation of Dhammas and these things, uh, why that is all about understanding the hindrances, yeah? understanding what the hindrance is, uh, then understanding the causality that leads to the hindrance, how the hindrance is abandoned and how it stays abandoned in the future. Uh, it's a very detailed investigation into these defilements of the mind, precisely because they are so profound, they're so hard to see. Uh, you say, I'm, I'm, there's nothing wrong, my, I don't have any defilements. How come it doesn't go any further? Well, the point is you have, yeah? It's just that they're so refined. Uh. So this is what is happening here. And even the Buddha had to, or the Buddha-to-be, had to look into these things uh, with uh, great care. Uh. And then he says, then, Ananda, it occurred to me, if, having seen the danger in sensual pleasures, or, if you like, sensual objects, uh, I would cultivate that insight, uh, and if, having achieved the benefit uh, in renunciation I would pursue that, uh, it is then possible that my mind would launch out upon renunciation, become placid, settled and liberated in it, uh, since I see it as peaceful. In other words, achieve samadhi and jhana. Sometimes later, having seen the danger in sensual pleasures, uh, I cultivated that insight, uh, and having achieved the benefit of renunciation, I pursued it. Uh, my mind then launched out upon renunciation, uh, became placid, settled, and liberated in it, uh, since I saw it as peaceful. Uh, so, uh, we're going to have a further look at the um, dangers of sensual pleasures, uh, so as to kind of see these things more from how the Buddha understands it, uh, and then uh, hopefully that will give you a little bit of extra oomph in your meditation practice. A lot of this that we are considering now is what I would call right view in Buddhism. It's, the, it's a particular outlook, a particular way of looking at the world. Not just a, any particular way, but a way that accords with reality, of course, uh, yeah? from the Buddha's point of view. Uh, it's not just a kind of a random thing, of course. Uh, <laughs> it is a, it is a um, right view in the sense of uh, according to reality. Uh, and of course that is the whole point of right view. The whole point of it is that we want to see something which uh, uh, is according to reality so that we can make good choices in life. Uh. So, let us have a look at these uh, uh, similes. Uh, Portalia Sutta, Majjhimanakaya 54. Another extract. Householder, suppose a dog overcome by hunger and weakness uh, was waiting by a butcher's shop. Then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton uh, of meatless bones smeared with blood. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of his hunger and weakness uh, by gnawing such a well-hacked, clean-hacked skeleton uh, of meatless bones smeared with blood? No, venerable sir. Uh, why is that? Because that was a skeleton of well-hacked, clean-hacked, meatless bones smeared with blood. Eventually that dog would reap weariness uh, and disappointment. Uh. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Uh, sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Blessed One. Uh. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. So here we have this uh, si famous simile of the dog. The dog is hungry and weak. Yeah, this is kind of you are you you know you are you have a kind of a desire this is hunger is like desire here yeah you have desire for sensual pleasures desire for something uh, and that desire interestingly also kind of makes you weak in a sense it gives you a weak mind a mind that is uh, engulfed in sensual pleasures is not strong uh, it is called uh, 
uh, dubbala in Pali, weak mind. And that weakness of mind uh, is only abandoned once the five hindrances are completely gone. Uh, and it's weak in the sense that you're not really able to focus, uh, you're not able to stay in the present moment. Uh, all these things that really make life wor worth worthwhile uh, uh, get tossed out of the window if you have the five hindrances. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I said before, when you are mindful, you have a feeling of being in charge of your life. Uh, when you have uh, con stillness, samadhi, you have even more in charge of your life. You're in charge of your mind. You feel you are in control. You can do what you want. You can direct your mind to this, direct your mind to that. And the mind is like an obedient dog. It says, yes, sir, yeah, or yes, ma'am. And then it follows along, whatever you say. It to. If you tell, the, tell your mind, okay, learn this Dhammapada verse in Pali, the mind says, yes, ma'am. And then you learn them in Pali, yeah? Easy. Yeah. And this is how it works. The mind it becomes very obedient and really easy to use. Uh, and this is the power of, uh, of these things. But uh, a mind like this is a weak mind. Uh, sensuality weakens the mind, makes it unable to see clearly, to focus on things properly, yeah, uh, uh, and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so there you are, the, the dog, the mind, sitting out in the butcher shop. Please give me some pleasures. Yeah, chuck them out the window. I need some pleasures. I need some happiness in life. Give me a nice new BMW car. Yeah, then I will be happy. Yeah. No, you won't. Yes, I will. I promise. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, and but of course, a butcher. This is ancient India. Butchers are not going to give any meat to a dog is too valuable to give away to the dogs, the butcher, it uh, hacks that skeleton, takes off all the meat, so every, as m every last little gram of meat is, is, is taken off, uh, and um, then all, the, all that is left is blood, yeah, so a little bit of blood left, and that, that it gets tossed out to the dog, yeah. and this poor dog is weak and waiting and hungry, and all it gets is a bit of blood on the bone, so it licks that licks those bones. Of course, it doesn't get any satisfaction out of that. Uh, it gets the taste of blood, makes it even more craving. Yeah, get the taste of blood. Wow, so nice. More craving, uh, and then it kind of, uh, nothing really happens, no satisfaction, and then after all the blood is gone, it runs off to the next butcher, yeah? Still waiting, hasn't learned its lesson. The lesson is butchers don't give meat to dogs. That's the harsh lesson of life. Uh, life is full of harsh lessons. Uh, this is one of those lessons. Uh, no meat for dogs. Uh, <laughs> uh, no real satisfaction in the realm of sensual pleasures. That's the harsh lesson of reality. Uh. So it goes on to the next uh, uh, butcher. Uh. Next butcher is just as mean as the previous one. Uh, yeah? All butchers are mean in this, in this uh, parable, in this simile. Uh, uh, takes off all the meat, a little bit of blood left on the bones, uh, chucks it out. Uh, dog still in the same state as before. Runs on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Uh. And in the middle of the running, it dies, uh, gets reborn as a little puppy, uh, continues the same practice as before, life after life after life, uh, never learning the lesson. Uh. And this is the reality for most of us. Uh, this is how it works. Uh, we're running around trying to find that satisfaction in the realm of the five senses. But uh, there is no such thing. Mara does not give you satisfaction in that realm. Mara says, come on, I will lead you on by craving. Uh, and so it is. We just carry on and on and on, never really finding the satisfaction that we actually want and that we are looking for. Uh, and sometimes it's so obvious. You can see this, you know, you are eating, for example, uh, and while you're eating, uh, you will notice that very often you're kind of semi-tasting the food you're eating now, and then you're already kind of heaping up your spoon or your fork with the next one, yeah? Already looking forward to the next one, never really in the present moment. Uh, yeah, that's kind of one very obvious example of that. Uh, but really, it is throughout life, whenever we have, whatever things we have, uh, they never really satisfy us to the way that they kind of promise they will satisfy us. Uh, and this is kind of the weird thing about anything in that realm. Uh, it uh, gives you a fleeting satisfaction for a while, uh, and after the fleeting satisfaction is uh, gone, then the craving comes back again. Uh, it never fills you up inside. Uh, and sometimes you get some very nice kind of sensual pleasures, uh, and then you feel a kind of emptiness almost afterwards, uh, as, if, you know, uh, as if you feel almost depressed or something like that, uh, because the meaning of life has kind of gone out of it. You got your nice sensual pleasures, but actually it wasn't very meaningful. It didn't do anything to your psychological state or your inner life. Uh, 
it never satisfies you because it never satisfies you you keep on running and running and running uh, and nothing ever happens uh, and we never really learn until one day the Buddha says but stop stop running like he says to Angulimala you are running stop running I I have stopped already now it's for you to stop uh, and then you, he tells you there is a different place you have to look for this satisfaction uh, and when you think about it it's actually very obvious because uh, the craving, the, the, the thing that we, the problem that we have is a psychological problem. Uh, yeah, there's an emptiness inside, something that we want to fill up. Uh, it's a psychological hole inside of us. Uh, and this is what we are trying to fill up with external things. Uh, but how can you fill up a psychological hole with external things? Uh, the external world is out there, it can give you some fleeting satisfaction, but it cannot fill up an inner psychological problem. Uh, to fill up that inner psychological hole, we need to look somewhere else. And this is where the Buddha comes along and says, this is how you do it. How do you do it? You do it by building up the in inner happiness through living in the right way, by living with morality, living with kindness, living in a way where you um, do all of these things that make you f give you that happiness inside that you have been looking for all along, that sense of satisfaction. Uh, and this is what you find if you look at the, the happiness of the spiritual path, the little bit of piti and sukha that you get in your meditation practice perhaps, uh, or the piti sukha that you get from being generous or kind towards others. Uh, if you look at that happiness, uh, it has a very different quality to it uh, than the kind of fleeting pleasure that you find in sensuality. Uh, in the sensuality, the craving is almost always there, conjoined with the experience. Uh, when you look at the piti and sukha that you have in, on the spiritual path, it is a peaceful happiness. The more peace there is, the greater is that happiness. Uh, it is the inverse of craving. Uh, yeah? It is almost the exact opposite of craving. Uh, and then, because it is a, and this is the reason why, is because it is a fulfilling happiness. It makes you feel fulfilled for the first time. It makes you feel complete. It means there is that hole inside of you is no longer there. And of course, if there is no hole, there's no point in craving, because you already got what you want. So that's why craving disappears. So the more profound, the more uh, uh, meaningful that happiness is that you get on the spiritual path, uh, the less craving there will be because you find that fulfillment inside. Uh, and this is why this path is the meaning of life. Yeah, precisely because we're always running after things. Uh, you're always trying to pursue craving and uh, uh, telling us that we're going to get satisfied if we actually pursue it, never fulfilling its promise. Yeah, this is why you should kind of see craving as your enemy, always lying to you, telling you, yeah, do this, then you'll be happy. No, it's lying. <laughs> so you stop listening to craving, you go instead follow the Buddha's path and that is where you find all of these things that you were looking for. Uh, so it actually does fulfill the meaning of life. You do find that completion that you have always been looking for. Finally you're satisfied. And this is why in deep samadhi you don't want to move because there's nothing more to be done. Craving has died, there's nowhere else to go. Completely satisfied, completely happy. Uh, there's nothing more to do. Uh. So, what have you done? You have discovered really the meaning of life. The only problem is that that samadhi doesn't last. Uh, and that is why we also need the insight. Uh, and the insight then adds to the samadhi and finalizes the whole thing. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the power of this path. And this is what I mean when I say it is the answer to the meaning of life. It gives that very profound satisfaction, fulfillment, completion that uh, everyone really is looking for. Yeah. So this is the simile of the dog. Yeah. And uh, you feel a bit sorry for this poor dog, but of course the point is that uh, most people are a bit like this dog, uh, running around, running around, running around, uh, and then you're dying in the middle of this running around. Uh, and uh, you, when you die, you're never really ready to die here. Uh. When people die, you always hear, oh, it happened so unexpectedly, it happened so suddenly. Of course it happened unexpectedly and suddenly. That's kind of the nature of the game. Uh. That's what you, sh you know, you should expect it to be unexpected, uh. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh. So this is what is going on here. So uh, that is the simile of the dog. <coughs> now, second simile here. Householder, suppose a vulture, a heron or a hawk seized a piece of meat and flew away. And then other vultures, herons and hawks pursued it, pecked and clawed it. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, heron or hawk does not quickly let go of that piece of meat, wouldn't it incur death or deadly suffering because of that? Yes, Venerable Sir, 
So too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. So this is the uh, simile of uh, this competition of essential pleasures. Uh, yeah, the meat here obviously symbolizes the sensual pleasures. Uh, and then you have well, someone gets some pleasure. Yeah, you get something nice and then other people want the same. And this is something, I mentioned this before already, uh, this is something is so obvious in our life. Uh, how often, uh, the, the one of the most obvious ones is how we often we like the same people. Uh, yeah, and we want to have the same people as our partner or husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, but somebody else also wants that boyfriend and girlfriend or husband and wife. Uh, so you, we kind of desperately try to get married so that we kind of then we tie them down a little bit. Uh, but then the rest of our life, even though we think we have tied them down, they're not that tied down sometimes. Uh, so we're still kind of worried and concerned about what they do. Yeah. So this is the problem, and this is the uh, thing, is that there's always that competition over uh, uh, in, in life, uh, over partners and, and, uh, and uh, wives and husbands, all this kind of thing. Yeah. And it's not just that, but it's kind of, it suffuses the entire sphere of this realm, because there are limited resources, uh, the economy is only so large, uh, there's only so many resources on this planet, uh, there's seven billion of us, uh, there's too many of us, uh, yeah, uh, that's the part of the problem. Uh, because there's so many of us, uh, and uh, we are, there's limited resources, we end up fighting over it. Uh, we have wars over resources, let's face it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have no doubt that many of these wars are fought because of resources. Uh, and then we fight with our family members over the inheritance. Uh, we fight with our brother and sisters over whatever else it is. Uh, and when there is only uh, not enough food, I actually hear there's enough food. Uh, Oh, so much food here. So I, I, I hear it's hard. To, at least for me, there is. Is there enough food for everyone? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Okay. Good. I, you know, enormous, which is very, which is very, very kind and very generous of you. But uh, generally, yeah, there is not enough resources in the world for everyone to have what they want, uh, and this is the problem. That's why we end up fighting over things. Uh. And uh, the Buddha has a beautiful sequence of terms that he uh, teaches in the uh, Maha Nidana Sutta, the great uh, discourse on, on causation, where he shows how uh, by having sensual desires uh, it eventually leads to conflict. Uh, and this is the thing about the problem, the really one of the fundamental problems with sensual pleasure and the desires, it always leads to conflict ultimately. It always leads to problems, to violence, to all these kind of things. Uh, because we desire things, uh, we start trying to get hold of them. Once we get hold of things, uh, like our house, our possessions, our, our family members, partners in life and all of this, uh, uh, once we get hold of it we, it, we own this. And because we own it, we don't want to give it away. It's mine. Yeah, it's keep, your, keep your hands off. This is mine. And because of that, that is where the conflict often arises. Uh, especially if some people are incredibly greedy. Yeah, some people take more than they deserve. Very, this happens very often. Uh, people, some people get too much, uh, whereas other people have nothing. Uh, and you wonder whether that really is fair or, or reasonable. Uh, so it is inherent in this, uh, in this um, sphere. And uh, the problem is, partly, that desires have no limit. Yeah, there is no limit. You think that if you have enough, then you'll be happy, but you won't. This is the thing. Yeah. You think that if, if at least I could have a nice BMW, yeah, everyone deserves a nice BMW. Huh? I don't know if every one of you agree with that, but some people would say that. Yeah, and uh, but still, you will not be happy once you have that. It's <laughs> blooming obvious. Uh, yeah, when you think about it. Uh, and uh, so the problem is that even if there was only one person on this planet, uh, and you had the whole planet, still you wouldn't be happy. Uh, still, you didn't have enough. Uh, and this shows you that there is never enough resources for everyone to go around. Uh, there is that nice little story found in the Ratapala Sutta, one of my favorite suttas towards the end. It's su such a beautiful sutta and I should have probably read it out here, but uh, anyway, next time maybe. And you, many of you will know this already because it's a very well-known uh, sutta, is where Ratapala is the he is a disciple of the Buddha with the most faith. And after he goes forth from his house love, the long story about him lying on the ground telling his parents, I will lie here and die, or you, or you let me go forth and become a monk. Okay, okay, go forth. Eventually they begin to relent. He becomes a monk, then he becomes an arahant, yeah? fully enlightened. Comes back to his parents after he's an arahant, uh, and his parents try to lure him back to lay life. Uh, it's too late, yeah? you're an arahant, this ca cannot be done. And then he um, uh, goes, after that, he goes to see the local king. There's a king in, in this area. Huh? And that is where the real Dhamma of this discourse happens. Uh, and then he, uh, 
he says that uh, 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 he says something to the king about the world is insatiate. Uh, yeah, insatiate. There is no satisfaction. In other words, uh, there is no final sense of yeah, I've got enough. Uh, and the king says, I don't understand. What do you mean? Well, wha what I mean, king, you are already pretty wealthy. But if someone came from the north and said, there's a large country in the north full of treasure and elephants and horses and wealth and everything, uh, and but your your country is stronger. Would you go and conquer it? And the king says, of course I would conquer it. And then he kind of goes on about that, you know, countries everywhere. And the point, of course, is that it doesn't matter how much you have. You always want more. If you have the whole earth, you're still not satisfied. If you have the solar system, if you have the galaxy, it's not enough. Yeah, even though you can never go to all the planets and all the suns in this galaxy, still, you want them just in case. Yeah, so, so you kind of have them on the back burner. One galaxy must be joking. I, I want the whole universe and still you're not happy. Yeah. And I sometimes I think the reason, you know, one of the modern ideas of physics is the idea of the multiverse. Uh, I think that was simply because we have so much craving as human beings, uh, we weren't satisfied anymore with one universe. Uh, so we had to create the idea of a multiverse. Uh, so there's unlimited number of universes. Uh. So the next thing we kind of looking forward to is the multi multiverse. Uh, yeah, and it's on and on it goes forever. Uh. But it's true though, yeah, and because the problem is we're looking in the wrong place. Uh. Uh, satisfaction, contentment, does, is not found in that area, and that's why it cannot work. Uh, it is found by looking inwards instead. Uh. So uh, we always fight, and this is one of the, I think, very kind of downsides of sensual pleasures. It always leads to violence. If it wasn't for sensual pleasures, uh, uh, quite likely we would have a fairly peaceful world, uh, and it would be very diff different from what it is. And what that shows us is that uh, sensuality uh, or violence is an integral part to our world. Uh, conflict is an integral part to our world. As long as there is sensuality, and there will always be sensuality, you have to have conflict, you have to have violence. Uh, this is kind of off-putting, isn't it? Uh, and because it is off-putting, you kind of get put off by the whole realm of sensuality a little bit. Uh, and you turn your mind in a different direction. If you really don't want to have conflict, uh, the only way is to move out of the realm of sensuality. Uh. It's pretty, ra it's very radical, yeah? This is really radical stuff. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and this is why I say that, you know, right, this is about right view. Uh, and this is the right view of the Buddha. It's actually quite different from almost how the whole, everyone else in the world looks at uh, reality. Uh. So this is the problem. But of course, once you go away from that realm of sensuality, once you seek your happiness inside of yourself, uh, once you seek it in the jhanas, the samadhi, the spiritual path, uh, once it's an internal thing, uh, it is no longer in conflict with other people. Uh, it is inside of you. So there's no problem there with the inner spiritual happiness. No problems. Uh. Not only is there no problems, but actually that inner spiritual happiness uh, is based on the development of kindness. Uh, on compassion, uh, on caring for others. Uh, because it is based on that, it actually leads to harmony in a very direct way as well. Uh. So this is the almost the exact opposite again of sensuality. Uh. So that is the uh, simile of the um, uh, fighting over the sensual pleasures, the herons, the vultures and the hawk, fighting it out over a piece of meat. Next one. Uh. Householder, suppose a man took a blazing grass torch and went against the wind. What do you think, householder, if that man does not quickly let go of that blazing grass torch, wouldn't that blazing grass torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or uh, death-like suffering? Uh, because of that. Uh, yes, venerable sir, so too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Uh, Sensual pleasures have been compared to a grass torch by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering uh, and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Uh, sensual pleasures are like a grass torch. So, so a grass torch gives you a little bit of uh, comfort because you can see in the dark, perhaps. Yeah, so you've got a grass torch. Uh, so it has a, is a degree of happiness to it. Uh, uh, and this is the uh, kind of the positive side of the sensual pleasures, that happiness that you get from it. Uh, but uh, uh, if you go against the wind, if you use that grass torch in the wrong way, if you really grasp hold of it and go against the wind, then of course you have a problem. Uh, and this is the problem with sensual pleasures. Once you, once you grasp them, uh, once you hold on to them, uh, they are going to cause trouble for you down the line because they're going to change. Uh, they're going to want you to 
uh, they're going to uh, nature is going to take them away from you. Huh? Yeah, and as soon as that happens, because you have grasped them, because you're attached to them, huh, you're going to suffer as a consequence. Huh? So this is the uh, the problem with sensual pleasures. As soon as you they are there, as soon as you use them, bang, you are caught in Mara's net, uh, and then you're going to suffer down the line. So every time you pick something up, uh, every time attach you attach to something. Uh, Remember that, uh, yeah. Remember that. What you're asking for, you're saying, "Please, may I suffer in the future?" Uh, yeah. So ask yourself, what, whatever is it, what is it that you are attached to in your life? What are the things that you hold on to? And there's probably mo uh, most of your possessions you are at least a little bit attached to. Some of them more than others, uh, and that is where Mara has got you. Uh, yeah, and Mara can kind of uh, uh, is going to test you in the future and see what happens because eventually it will all have to go. Uh, and then you will suffer here. So what do we do about this? And this is kind of one of those things that is interesting in Buddhism. Sometimes Buddhist people say, oh, I must be a good Buddhist, I must not attach. As if there is a choice. As if you can choose not to attach. You cannot choose not to attach. It's impossible. Why? Because you have a sense of self. And this is one of the things the sense of self does. It attaches to things. Because what is that sense of self? Well, that sense of self consists of some of the aspects of uh, what you take yourself to be, some of your perceptions, some of your feelings, some of your volition, what you are built up of, some of your mental constituents. Uh, that is what is, what makes up that sense of self. Uh, and because that is your sense of self, you're going to attach to those things. Uh, yeah? Otherwise, uh, if, if you're not attached to those things, then if it's as if, pe you know, if there's those things get taken away, your very sense of identity is destroyed. Uh, so of course you have to attach to those things. Uh, so your will, yeah, the, your ability to act internally, uh, your ability to feel certain things, your ability to perceive uh, all of these things you are uh, attached to. You have to be attached to it because you identify it, uh, identify with these things. Uh, your awareness, your ability to know also is you will you will attach to her. Uh. But and then of course it expands out from that. Uh, that is not enough. The ego is already there, but uh, many of those feelings that you have and many of those perceptions that you have, they kind of seep out into the world outside of you. Uh, because those feelings that you identify with inside, uh, uh, inside uh, they are also relate to the things you have outside. If you are, have a nice boyfriend or girlfriend, yeah, you think, oh, or partner in life, you think, wow, you know, they give me so much happiness. So of course you're going to attach, because that happiness inside, that mental thing is what you attach to. Huh? So, they, that will, so, it, so the inner sense of ego then seeps out into the world outside and appropriates all of these things uh, that make the inner ego what it actually is. Uh, and in this way, as long as you have an ego, you have to attach, you have no choice. Uh. So what are we supposed to do then? If we have to that, well, what, is, what we have supposed to do? Well, first of all, you can see here why it is so important ultimately to have insight into the ego. This is why the non-self insight is so important in Buddhism, because the only way you're going to stop attaching is by having that kind of insight. Uh. But before you get to that point, uh, there's actually a lot we can do. Uh. And one of the main things that you do on the Buddhist path uh, is simply practicing the path. Uh, you are finding more happiness within, uh, more equanimity within, uh, more peace within, uh, and external things are not so important anymore. So you're actually reducing your attachment quite naturally simply by practicing the Buddhist path. Uh. So all you have to do is just turn a little bit around, uh, get more of your happiness from the spiritual life, uh, and then actually you start detaching from the world. Uh. And it's good. Uh, if you do that, you become a better person uh, because you become less dependent on external things. Uh, yeah, when you're less attached, it doesn't make you a bad person because you don't attach to your family anymore. It makes you a better person because you have more clarity. Uh, you have more metta. You have more kindness. You have more time for everyone. Uh, instead of having a vested interest in what your family does, uh, so you become upset if they do the wrong thing, uh, you have instead metta. I say, oh, whatever. It's up to you. Yeah? If you get bad grades in school, okay. Your, your problem, yeah? I'm going to support you, but uh, it's in the end it's up to you. Huh? And in this way, we have less of that vested interest uh, in what our family members do, huh? and we're more cool about those things. Uh. So this is how attachment goes down. And of course, also, it is helpful to remember the problem of attachments, uh, yeah, the problems of the sensual world. That is what we're doing now, remembering what right view is. Uh, because just by remembering that, you let go a little bit. Uh, and that view, that understanding, helps you to move in the right direction. Huh? So that is a simile of the 
grass torch with a little bit added to it. Uh, now we come to this really uh, awesome simile. It's awesome because it's really hard to understand. It's very profound. Uh, but um, and this is how it goes. Uh, Householders suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals without flame or smoke. Then a man came who wanted to live and not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. And two strong men seized him by both arms and dragged him towards that charcoal pit. What do you think, householder? Would that man twist his body this way and that? Yes, venerable sir, why is that? Uh, because that man knows that if he falls into that charcoal pit, uh, he will incur death or deadly suffering because of that. Uh, so too, householder, a no noble disciple considers thus. Uh, sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering, much despair, while the danger in them is great. So charcoal pit. Yeah, it's pretty hard to, to grasp, isn't it? It's kind of, whoa, you, you've got to be on a different planet, a bit like Ajahn Brahm, to really get, this, get these things, uh, because they are so profound. Uh, someone who attains samadhi regularly in deep samadhi and who has profound insight into the Dhamma will be able to grasp this. But for most people, very difficult to see this clearly. Huh? And uh, to, to be able to get some kind of understanding of what is meant here, uh, sometimes a little bit of faith and confidence in the teachings of the Buddha is required. And the Buddha explains this simile in another sutta called the Magandhya Sutta. This is the Majjhimanikai 75, uh, mid-length saying 75, if you want to look it up at some stage. Uh, and there he says that uh, the way to understand this is through the simile of the leper. Uh, yeah, the leper, if you have leprosy, leprosy is this disease that is very, very, you have sores all over your limbs and it's very itchy and very, very difficult to bear. Yeah, this is leprosy is really bad. So the Buddha says, well, it's like as if you are a leper, you have a leper here and you have leprosy and when you are a leper, you go to the fire and you burn your limbs over the fire because it's so incredibly itchy, so incredibly uncomfortable. And the only way to get rid of that itchiness is to literally burn your limbs over a fire. Imagine. Yeah, it's terrible. Huh? So you burn your limbs and then you get some relief from the leprosy. You still have some burns, of course, but that's nothing compared to the itchiness of the leprosy. Huh? And then uh, uh, the Buddha says, well, an, uh, then that man, he goes to a doctor. Huh? The doctor is able to cure him of the leprosy. Huh? And then the Buddha says to Magandhya, says, well, Magandhya, that leper, huh, would he now, after he is cured, go back to that same fire huh, and still burn his limbs over the fire? No, says Magandhya. Well, why is that? Well, because uh, previously his faculties were distorted. Uh, yeah, he wasn't able to see clearly. Uh, that is why he na and now he, because his faculties are repaired, there's no way he's going to burn his uh, limbs there anymore. It's exactly the same thing with sensual pleasures. Uh, sensual pleasures, your faculties are distorted. Uh, you cannot see things as they actually are. What actually is painful appears to you as happiness, uh, as pleasurable. Uh, it's really radical. Yeah, this is really, really radical stuff. It's like, whoa, wh wh what, what does this actually mean? And, and what this one, one of the things that it, I think it means is that, uh, uh, and this is, kind of, this is interesting because there have been some modern experiments about pleasures, uh, uh, sensual pleasures in particular, and they have put people into MR, MRI machines uh, and measured their brain, right, and seeing kind of what happens in the brain when you enjoy certain sensual pleasures. And one of the things that they found out is that uh, uh, th sometimes when you think that you're perceiving a pleasure, uh, there is the pain center in your brain that lights up. Uh. Isn't that kind of fascinating? Uh, and then you read this in the sutta, and the Buddha said it two and a half thousand years ago, uh, and we took us two and a half thousand years to invent the MRI scanner first before we could figure it out. Uh, the Buddha already told us, for goodness sake, why didn't we listen to him before? Uh, but now we know, actually, there's some truth to that. Uh, some of the pleasures that we feel in life, they actually light up the pain center in our brain. Uh, there is a degree of pain there that is incurred as we are perceiving these things to be pleasurable. It's really fascinating. I, I should really dig up some of these experiments because it's kind of uh, fascinating to see this. So, uh, and of course, 
part of the problem is that uh, there is always craving involved with sensual pleasures. Uh, it comes together with the pleasure. You can't really disentangle these things completely. Uh, and craving is a state of restlessness, uh, is a state of agitation. Uh, you're not really satisfied. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it is uh, pleasurable. One of the ways of thinking about this, I don't, know, have I don't know if any of you have smoked. Have you smoked cigarettes, anyone here? Uh, Anyway, I, I remember when I was young and I was kind of foolish and, and cool. I w sometimes I would smoke cigarettes. I was never addicted, so it wasn't a big problem. I just occasionally I would do it, yeah, just to, to, be, to be kind of, uh, when you're young, it's so important to be cool. Yes, yeah? so I also wanted to be cool when I was young, I guess. Uh, and then I didn't realize that coolness actually happens when you become a monk. That's when you become really cool. Yeah? Practice the path all the way. That's the real coolness. Uh, but anyway, so, and, and cigarettes are so terrible, yeah, I, absolutely, it's astonishing how you kind of, you'd force yourself to smoke these things because you want to be cool, but actually it's really, really terrible. Huh? But the weird thing is that once you become addicted to them, huh, you have to have them. The taste, the terribleness is still the same, but you have to have them because you are addicted, yeah? The craving is so strong, it overrides the pain that actually is there completely, yeah? and then, oh, now I feel good, yeah? Because I get the nicotine kick or whatever. Yeah? And it's a little bit like that, like what he's talking about here. Actually, it is not pleasurable at all, yeah? but it feels pleasurable if you are addicted to cigarettes, yeah? because it's so, in a very, very powerful addiction. They say it is on par with heroin addiction, cigarette and uh, nicotine, so it's a very, very powerful addiction. That's why it's so hard to give up. So anyway, so that gives you some idea of uh, uh, the charcoal pit, yeah? So if you have something really nice, think charcoal pit, charcoal pit, and then you kind of push it away, yeah? Next time you get a new car, charcoal pit, charcoal pit, uh, and be, be careful, uh, just to remind yourself yeah, of the downside of these things. Uh. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, not, yeah, just, you know, it's important to enjoy life a little bit, but remember these things are more for reflection, yeah, not to kind of to be silly about these things and try to force perceptions that are not real, they are just a way of reflecting about this. Uh, uh, and uh, this one here is h difficult to reflect about this one, but the uh, three previous ones actually are really easy to reflect on and to understand what is going on. Uh. Let's go on to the next one. Uh. We've got three more to go through, and uh, the last one I've actually talked about already, so two perhaps. So the next one is as follows. Mm, where are we? Uh, Householder, suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks, lovely groves, lovely meadows, and lovely lakes, and on waking he saw nothing of it. So too, Householder, a noble disciple, considers thus. Uh, Sensual pleasures have been compared to a dream by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Uh, they are like a dream because they never really, they're always about your looking forward to them, uh, yeah, thinking about them. Wow, it's going to be so nice when I get that, it's going to be so good. When I get this partner in my life, whoa, I will be happy forever after. Uh, does that, does that happen? Uh, <laughs> you know the dream, yeah, we all know the dream. I've been there, I, I was kind of, I've been, been through those things as well. I only became a monk when I was 30, so it's kind of, you know, I've been through all of those, that kind of stuff, I know what, it, know what it's like. It's always the dream is much greater than the reality. Yeah. And especially when you are young, you think about the kind of life you're going to have, you know, how successful you're going to be and all these kind of things. Uh, and usually you're a little bit conceited when you're young. I don't know, was it? I think that's usually the case. You have these kind of big visions about the future. And then when you get older, you start to downscale a little bit. Yeah, the dream kind of is not going to quite the same as it was before. Uh, you think you're going to change the world, but really it's the world that changes you, of course, instead. Uh, that's the reality of it. Uh. So, uh, you, uh, but there's this dream is there, and the dream is never reality, it never really happens. Uh, and we keep on dreaming throughout our entire lives. Uh, and towards the very end of our life, the dream that we have is that, oh, I s I'm going to be here tomorrow, I'm going to have at least a few more days. Uh, that's kind of the final dream. But of course you're not. But then suddenly before you know it, bang, you're gone. Uh, and uh, while you're still craving, while you're still thinking that you have more time left. Uh, so we're never really there, we're never really dreaming, and it's also, we're always dreaming, we're never really, never really there when we, with craving. Yeah. And um, 
And you can see this also with ordinary cravings, yeah, about the dream of getting something. So much of our life is actually the dream of getting things uh, and all the hard work that lies there to get there. Yeah? We're going to have a nice ha house, we're going to have a nice car, we're going to have a nice relationship and all these kind of things. Uh, the dream and the, all the hard work that goes into it uh, is a very important part of it. But when you actually get it, it's actually not that exciting. Then you need another dream to carry on. And part of the problem there, part of the reason why it is like that, uh, is because we identify with the doer. Uh, we identify with the craving. Uh, yeah, the doing itself is actually part of our, of our identity. So we enjoy the very act of doing these things, of getting there. Uh. So this is part of the problem. And but when you actually get it, actually, it is far less interesting than you thought it uh, uh, thought it might be. Uh, again, craving is lying to you, uh, is whispering you in your ear and telling you all kinds of stories uh, and after a while we shouldn't really believe them anymore. Uh. So this is a really nice symbol and I think we can all we can all kind of get that to some extent, yeah? The dream, uh, dream about the future which never actually happens uh, quite in that way. Uh. Then uh, we have the next one. Uh. Householder, suppose a man borrowed goods on loan, a fancy carriage, fine jeweled earrings, uh, and proceeded and surrounded by those borrowed goods, uh, he went to the marketplace. Uh, and people seeing him would say, Sirs, uh, that is a rich man, that is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Uh, then the owners, whenever they saw him, would take back their things. Uh, what do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that man to become dejected? Uh, Yes, Venerable Sir, why is that? Because the owners took back their things. So too, Householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to borrowed goods by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. So sensual pleasures, here you can see why it is so important to remember that sensual pleasures are also the objects of the sensual realm. So here it's obviously the objects that are the borrowed goods. Yeah? Here this, the desire is not really the main part of this. Uh. So sensual objects, the, all the objects that we own, all the things that we think in the, we own in the world uh, are borrowed goods. Uh. Yeah, they're going to have to be, they're going to have to go again. And we know that that is true. And uh, sometimes we have this kind of false impression that we own things, uh, but actually we don't really own anything at all, uh, because nature can take things back at any time. It is nature that owns almost uh, owns everything, uh, including our body. Our body can be snatched back like that. Uh, you die, and that's it. You're gone. Uh. So everything has to go, and sometimes the things. Um, go, of course they have to go at the very least at the end of our life, that is very, very obvious, everything has to go when you die, but very often it goes before that. Uh, yeah, things fall apart, things disappear, relationships break up, uh, people die, people get sick, uh, all of these kind of things. Uh, everything is borrowed goods. Uh. So how do you relate to borrowed goods? Uh? Do you relate to borrowed goods as holding on to it really hard, this is mine, this is mine, nothing is going to happen to it? Uh, not really. If something is borrowed goods, you have a very different attitude to it uh, from when you own it. Uh, if it's borrowed, you, you don't never attach so much to it. Uh, if you borrow something from a friend, uh, yeah, you borrow their car or whatever for a, a couple of weeks, you never really think it of it as yours. Uh, you are perhaps a bit more careful with it because you know that it's not yours. Uh, and you never really, you know, you, you don't look at it in the same way. Uh. So really, all our possessions, uh, we should look at them like that. Uh, yeah, as if you borrow a car from a friend for a fortnight. Uh, if you can look at all your possessions like that, uh, yeah, or you, <laughs> or then, of course, you have far less attachment to these things. And this is the realistic way of actually looking at uh, uh, all the possessions in our life. Not only possessions, uh, all our relationships, uh, all the people that we're with, uh, all of that is borrowed goods. Uh, ultimately, also our body is also borrowed goods. Uh. What is this? You can speak uh, live. Do you want to speak? Uh? Car number 3956. Uh, white car. Uh. Anyone? Anyone's car? Uh? No? No? Okay. Nobody's car. Okay. So that's good. Nobody's car. Yeah. No, o no owner, which is good. Uh. Just, a bor just borrowed. Uh. <laughs> so we have already, we're already getting there. Yeah. So, uh, so so this is then the thing. Uh, 
if everything is borrowed, we start to again turn away from that world of sensual pleasures and we turn to those things that we own a little bit more. What is it that we own in this world? And again, it is very obvious, the thing that we own in this world, the thing that makes a difference, the thing that is more steady, are the qualities of our mind. These are the things that we own. And this is why the whole spiritual path is about building up the internal qualities. These qualities are the things that you take with you into the future life. Even though you have to leave everything else behind, this is what carries on into the future. So invest in the things that you own. Don't invest in the borrowed goods, uh, because the borrowed goods are going to have to be left behind anyway. Uh. That is really the message here, yeah? Be a smart investor. Uh. Everybody wants to be a smart investor, but this is the real investment advice, yeah? That actually matters. Uh. People get this idea of investment completely wrong. This is what we mean by investment in Buddhism. Uh. Invest in your mind. Uh. What does that mean? And what it means, and I think people sometimes get this wrong, it doesn't mean that straight away you have to become a monk or a nun and kind of give up the world. That is not really what it means. It means that the attitude to how we live is different. We think more about how we live. We're not so concerned about social status, so concerned about material well-being, how much we have, all of these kind of things. We're not so concerned about the what or the how much of life. We're concerned about the how of life, how you gain these things, the process by which we live, uh, the process by how we work, the process in our family, all of these things are what matters. Uh, and by the process I mean, how do we do these things? Do we do it with kindness? Uh, do we do it with gentleness? Do we do it with compassion? Uh, and if you live your life with those qualities, uh, then you know that you are living in a way where you are investing in your mind uh, instead of investing in borrowed things. Uh. So invest where it matters. Uh, yeah, this is really the answer here. And it means that you start to reassess how you live. Uh, it starts to, the qualities that you put into your everyday life. You, you, you do things in a different way. Uh, you don't do things haphazardly anymore. Uh, you don't uh, become angry just because things don't go your way. Because you know that going your way is irrelevant. It's not about that. It's about the anger. That is the issue. Uh, you cannot expect things to go your, your way anyway. So what's the point of getting angry about it? Uh, and then you have the right attitude, uh, and then everything starts to change. Uh, and your whole life starts to turn around and become different. Uh. And it's very powerful. The more you reflect on these things, the more you internalize these kind of ideas, this is all about right view, uh, the more you actually are aware every moment of the day that you actu whether you're doing the right thing or not. Uh, yeah? This is kind of the purpose of right view. You want it to seep into your bones so deeply inside that it uh, guides you in every time you do an act, every time you think something, you're guided by this right view that is deep down inside of you uh, and, and uh, informs your actions, informs everything you do. Uh. So this is kind of the point of this. And this is why the stream mentor is a stream mentor. Why, once you become a stream mentor, because you're, you are said to have right view, that right view is lodged in your psychology to such a point that you can no longer act in uh, Contra contravention or against that right view. Uh, you always act in accordance with it. Uh, this is what it means to become a stream entry. So we try our very best to approximate uh, the idea of stream entry uh, to uh, live in a good way. Lodge these views deep inside of us. And this is why it is so useful to reflect on them and consider them. Uh. So don't just uh, listen to them now. Try to consider them a little bit also outside of retreat time if you can, yeah, by listening to Dhamma talks and reading the suttas a little bit yourself, uh, and then uh, this process will happen gradually. Uh. Let us come to the last of these similes. Uh. Householders, suppose there were a dense grove not far from some village or town, uh, within which there was a tree laden with fruit, mango fruit maybe, uh, but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. Then a man came needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit. And he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Thereupon he thought, this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit have fallen to the ground. I know how to climb a tree. So let me climb this tree, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. Then a second man came, needing fruit, seeking fruit, wandering in search of fruit, uh, and talk, taking a sharp axe. He too entered the grove and saw the tree laden with fruit. Uh, thereupon he thought, 
This tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit have fallen to the ground. I do not know how to climb a tree, so let me cut this tree down at its root, eat as much fruit as I want, and fill my bag. And he did so. What do you think, householder? If that first man who has climbed the tree doesn't come down quickly, when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or his foot or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or death-like suffering because of that? Uh, yes, venerable sir, so too, householder. A noble disciple considers thus. Uh, sensual pleasures have been compared to the fruits on a tree by the Blessed One. Uh, they provide much suffering, much despair, while the danger in them is great. Uh, so this is what I already talked about this simile before, this idea of wandering around in samsara, you're wandering in the forest, in the grove, uh, in the jungle, not seeing anything much around you, uh, and kind of looking out for sensual pleasures, uh, and then one day you see this tree full of sensual pleasures, yeah? It's like, um, I don't know, maybe you win the lottery or something, I don't know, or maybe you kind of, you, whatever happens, yeah, something happens, and you see all these beautiful sensual pleasures, you climb that tree, and then you, start eating mangoes, you start eating those wonderful fruit, whatever they are, uh, and because you do that, you are intoxicated, you are heedless, you have no idea what's going on. Uh, this other man comes along, chops down the tree, uh, and because you are heedless, uh, because you don't know what you're doing, uh, the tree falls while you're still up there, and then you incur death or death-like suffering. Uh, not a deadly suffering, but death-like suffering is more, more appropriate there, I think. I'm not sure what deadly suffering means, to be honest. Uh, deadly suffering? Uh, anyway. Death-like suffering. And this is the realm of sensuality, where we are intoxicated by sensual pleasures. Uh, we don't know what's going on. Uh, we do stupid things, like climbing trees when other people come with axes. Uh, yeah, not a good idea. Uh, and then the trees fall, and while we do stupid things, uh, we commit all kinds of bad acts, but body, speech, and mind, and when you die, you think, oh no, why did I do all those bad things? I'm dead now. All I can take with me into the future are the bad actions I did. Everything else has to be left behind. Uh, that's when you really regret your bad actions, uh, when you understand that's all you take with you into the future. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Uh, the moment you die, if you have lived a bad life, uh, all you take with you into the future are the bad actions that you have done. Uh, just imagine lying on your deathbed and all you can think of are bad acts that you have done. Everything else has to go. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, absolutely terrible. Your whole future is starting to look very dark, uh, very compromised because of that. Uh, so this again is it's a very useful perception of death, yeah? Uh, you're lying there and now you know that all you have with you, all that is left, is the karma from the past, the actions from the past, uh, and you feel bad about yourself because you've done the wrong thing. Yeah? This is what happens if you become intoxicated by sensual pleasures uh, and you allow money and possessions and status and what have you to rule your life, uh, then you have a serious problem. A lot of people in this world allow precisely that to happen, and then uh, this uh, problem arises as a consequence. Uh, but, uh, so the, the way to get out of this, and this is that beautiful simile I also mentioned the other day, or the beautiful story in Ajahn Brahm's book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, uh, where he talks about traveling in the jungle of Guatemala and coming to the pyramid, uh, ancient Mayan pyramids of Guatemala, and then climbing that pyramid, uh, and for the first time coming out of the jungle, uh, and coming above it all, and then looking down, and when you look down, you see the jungle in perspective, you see all the little paths, uh, you see the man with the axe coming with the axe, he's coming with the axe, okay, I better be careful, yeah? You know that the man with the axe is always around the corner. Uh, and so you get a perspective on everything. You understand the problem with sensual pleasures uh, because you have the bird's eye view. Uh, and this is what samadhi is like. The samadhi is the stepping out of the jungle of the world, uh, allowing all the five senses and everything else to remain below. Now you understand for the first time what it is. Uh, why? Because you have stepped out of the swamp of sensuality uh, and you have the clarity which comes uh, as a consequence. Uh. Okay. So that is the uh, Portalia Sutta for you, huh? and uh, uh, that is as much as I wanted to do huh, for the meditation part of this retreat. Huh? So uh, I hope you enjoy that, and uh, uh, I'm going to please <coughs> just carry on meditating, uh, and then we can continue with the Q and A at four o'clock in an hour and a half. Huh? So see you back again in an hour and a half's time. Huh?